If you have your Bibles with me, open to Genesis chapter 2. Last week I began preaching this series called, Why Am I Here? And it's the fundamental question of life. Everyone is asking this at some point in their life. What, what is my purpose? What am I doing? Uh, at least I'm asking that a lot. Make sure I'm tracking on purpose and make sure I'm doing what God is calling me to do. And so we began last week with the most fundamental answer to that question. That is, God is calling you, primary reason why you're here, God has called you to be a worshiper. He's called you to live in communion with Him and worship Him. Numero uno. Can we say amen? amen? Number one. Second reason why God put you on this earth is to live in community with other people. He placed you here to live in community with other people. The Bible says in the book of Genesis chapter 2 verse 15, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, Of every tree of the garden you may eat freely or freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. It's not good that man be alone. So what happens here is the Lord creates Eve, right? And Eve is with Adam, and they're the first family on the planet in history. And so this, though this verse is primarily focused toward that, and the primary context is of marriage and building a family, I want to expand it and just say it's not good for man to be alone. It's not good for anyone. Whether you're single or married, that's, I'm not talking about that. It's just you're supposed to live in community with people. God placed you on planet Earth to live in relationship with people. No man is an island. No one is to do this alone. You need some other people in your life to help you do this thing. You need some people who you love. You need some people who you love to pour out your heart to. You need some people who get on your last nerve. Those are the EGR people, extra grace required. You need some of those people. You need, we, need, we need everybody, right? We need this whole human race to push us forward. You need a community of people around you in your life to help you live life. There was a book called The Hidden Life of Trees. I thought it was interesting. The author said trees of the same species... They grow in the same stand and are connected to each other through their root system. This is better than a tree growing alone by itself. He said because when they grow together, the trees create an ecosystem that moderates the extremes of heat and cold, stores a great deal of water, and generates a great deal of humidity. And th this protected environment in this, trees can live to be very old. So even the trees know to live together. <laughs> That there's, they're better together than they are apart. It's a community that makes things happen. Amen? We live in a disconnected society. And it seems like the more advanced we get technologically, we are more disconnected. It's crazy. It's like Facebook and Twitter and all these things were created really to connect people. But it's like it almost eats up our time because we sit alone and look at it all. And we just weren't designed to do that. You know, we just were, we were designed to have relationships with people. I'm not, trying to part, I'm not trying to pull us back into the past, but you think about maybe the way some of us grew up. We grew up in community with people. I grew up very close to my cousins and my family, and we, we, they were our best friends, and we went to each other's houses, and, uh, you know, dark was the time to come home. We could play outside, and I grew up on 90 acres of mountainside, so we could play all day and with our friends and our cousins, and it's just, I don't know, it's just a different society. You had often, in years past, many generations living under the same roof. So you learned from other generations how you should live life. Right. Grandma taught you how to make cornbread. Yeah. Right. At least did us, you know, that you learned that skill. Because cornbread is, is an important life skill. <laughs> it's a life hack you need <laughs> to make cornbread. Hallelujah. You know, you just learned, and you learned these things from your family. You, and the community, you need each other. We need the older folks in our life. We need the younger people in our lives. Amen? Amen. You need community. Hallelujah. Well, God created the basic unit of society, which is the family. It's a creation of God. 
God created Adam and Eve right out of the gate. That's how this thing's going to happen. They were commanded then to take charge of the area that God had given them. You take charge in the earth realm. You replenish, you multiply, and you go forth and do what I'm calling you to do. You know, wonder what kind of intelligence Adam had without being affected by the fall. Wonder what kind of capacity he had. He's naming animals. He's doing all kinds of stuff. No sin in the way. Perfect relationship. Could you imagine that? It's ama- Well, that's where we're going back to. The Bible begins in a garden. It ends in a garden. The Bible begins with a blind date. It ends with the marriage supper of the Lamb. <laughs> Amen? Hallelujah. It's a, it's a love story. It's a story of Him creating community. So God created the family. No wonder Satan fights the family like he does. No wonder he comes and, 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 and tries to destroy the family through divorce because if he can break up that basic unit of society, you can wreck some people's lives. If you break down that basic unit of society, it really has ripple effects throughout. The, 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 it, it, there's just effects that just happen. Yes, God can bring healing and can get over that, but there's just effects that happen that we have to deal with. We're dealing with, in a large, to a large extent, a fatherless society today. And it's, it's tragedy. Not only did God create a family, God created a nation. The next way God wanted to show community was that He created Israel. And Israel lived in community with one another. When they went to camp, they camped according to tribes. They put the glory of God in the center. That's where the tabernacle was. And they camped all around it in community. Before He took them to the promised land, which He could have done in a few days... He took them to the heart of the desert and took them to to Mount Sinai to learn how to worship Him and how to live in community with one another. Here's the laws. Here's how you need to treat people. Here's how you do not need to treat people. Here's how you need to worship. Here's how you need to eat. Here's how you need to do marriage. Here's how you need to do life. Here's how you handle sicknesses. I mean, on down through the line, God really gave them a blueprint for community. When we think about the Jewish law, we often think, oh, what a bummer, man, because we see it through the New Testament eyes. But you know, when the people of Israel received the law, they rejoiced. If you go to a Jewish synagogue to this day, the high point of the service is when they bring the Torah in, the law. I had a friend said he was in a synagogue one time and they brought the Torah in carrying it and they dropped it. Everyone gasped and they closed the service. Is that precious to them? The Torah, the law coming in. God, come on, say it with me. God created a family. God created a nation. And then ultimately, God created the church. God created the church. So Israel in the Old Testament, if you read the Greek Septuagint version of the Old Testament, the writers used a term for the church, and it was called ekklesia. Ekklesia. The called out ones. It comes from this Greek root, Kaleo, which means to call or summon. So in ancient Greek democratic societies, they would call men of certain age to come out and vote or come out for community forums. It was the beginnings of democracy, you know, in early Greek society. It was called the ecclesia, the called out ones. So Israel through the wilderness is called the ecclesia. And then into the New Testament, the New Testament writers predominantly were using the Old Testament Septuagint, so they borrowed that term and said now God is forming His new ecclesia called the church. And we are now the ones called out. We've been called out from darkness into His marvelous light. We've been called out from the world into the kingdom. We've been called from hopelessness into eternal hope. We've been called out of, uh, we were a people, Paul said, who were not a people. Because we didn't know God. But now we are the people of God. Oh, hallelujah. That makes me want to be happy right there, doesn't it you? You were not a people. Now you are a people. You are the people of God. And now we've been, Paul says, grafted into the vine of Israel. We were outside the covenants and outside the laws and outside the promises of God. But God says, come on, I'm going to graft you into the vine and bring you in. And now the Spirit cries out as He brings us in, crying out, Abba, Father. It's the Spirit of adoption. 
And now the spirit of adoption has come and adopted us from the world and brought us into and placed us in the ecclesia of God. Come on, can somebody shout amen? You know, adoption is a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Because when, when someone is adopted, the parents take a risk. The parents take a risk. They don't know what this child's going to be like. They don't know how this child's, what the DNA makeup of this child is. How, but they take that risk because of love. And love calls them to risk. Love always involves risk. It causes those parents to risk and take a chance. We have a, a man in our congregation. His mother was here. She was the oldest living member of Fountain of Life Church, and we buried her in 2020, and uh, he was adopted. And I, I asked him permission to share his story in years past, and he said his parents came down. It was Mrs. Hobbs. said he's, they came down to an orphanage in North Carolina looking for a baby, but they didn't have any babies at the time, but he was a, a little bit older, but he was standing up in the crib bed, and as she walked out, he hollered out, Take me! Take me. And they stopped and went over and took him and took him home. Asking no questions, had nothing prepared. Said they pulled out a drawer, put some blankets in it, and laid, in it, laid him in it, and that was his first night in the drawer. <laughs> that's the beauty of that's the beauty of being adopted into God's family. Yeah. Maybe you've had a broken family. Well, you've come into a whole family here. Maybe you grew up fatherless, well now you have a father, hallelujah. Maybe you grew up and didn't even know your family, well now you got real family. I've been, all, I've been in a lot of parts of the world, and I've been all over the United States, and everywhere I go, I've met the family of God. I mean, you know, I was raised in the South, raised in the Appalachian Mountains, and so, uh, you know, we didn't go to the North very much, it was like a foreign place to go north to us. And then I started traveling as an evangelist and I found out that there were people in Wisconsin who were my family members who loved Jesus just like I did and just so sweet to me. I met New Yorkers. Come on, I'm telling you, I met New Yorkers now. And I ha have some in our church who came out of the sit New York City, man, and some of the greatest, most godly, humble, loving Jesus people I've ever met in my life. And here, I planted a church. Years ago, I planted a church in Washington, D.C., and here I am, a, a southern Appalachian boy, born in the coal mining, uh, coal mining counties of Virginia, and I, my right-hand guy was a New York Puerto Rican born in Spanish Harlem. It's a wonder we could even understand each other. But we went and planted a church together. Hallelujah! Why? Because he's my brother. Come on, if you're in Christ, you're my brother or you're my sister. We, I know we maybe overdid the word brother through the years, but I got, I got kind of tired of all these, all these titles in church. Everybody's a bishop and everybody's a this and everybody's a that. I said, you know what? I read in the New Testament, they just called each other brother. So I just would go up to people of even high rank, not to be disrespectful, but I'd just say, brother, it's good to see you. Come on, I'm your brother. You're my brother. You're my sister. We're in the family of God together. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. 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 And you know what you have to do in a family is you have to get along with everybody no matter how offensive they can be. They may not be your favorite aunt or your favorite uncle, but you still go to Thanksgiving dinner and endure a few blessed hours with them. Because if they're in the family, blood's thicker than water. Hallelujah. Somebody else better not say anything about us, but family, we can deal, right? So yeah, you, we're in the family of God. So how about taking that same attitude into the church? Because we have this offensive attitude that if someone does something against us, we're done. And we get so offended... And then when you walk in offense, it really shuts the door to the blessings of God to be able to come into your life. Don't let that happen. Let 2022 be the year that you're walking out of offense. Let it be the year you're leaving that behind. 2021, man, I could get ticked off, but 2022, I'm a different being. Well, this is my year. Hallelujah. My year of walking. Come on, raise your hand with me. Make this pledge. No, I'm just kidding you. Come on. Just say 2022. No offense in Jesus' name. Now wave goodbye behind your back to all that stuff. 
You know, there's something that uh, happened when Jesus came out of the wilderness after being tempted by the enemy, Luke chapter 4, he goes to his hometown of Nazareth, he walks into the synagogue, steps up, opens the scroll of Isaiah and reads, For the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me, he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. You know, and he reads through that passage. The Bible says they were offended at him. They were offended at him. So what happened? They tried to push him off a cliff. And the Bible said he made his way through the crowd and escaped. But then we come and we fast forward later. It says he was doing miracles all throughout the Galilee and all throughout Israel. I mean, he's healing people. There's like, if you look at Matthew chapter 8, it says he healed them all. I mean, there's a gathering of people and everyone was getting healed. I don't think it was just hyperbole. I think he was healing them all. And there's several instances where that happens. But yet, the Bible says he could, except in Nazareth, when he went home, he could only heal a few sick folk. Well, that would be revival to us, to have a few sick folk healed. But to him, it was like limiting his potential, and it was because they were walking in offense and couldn't receive from him. So if you walk in a spirit of offense, you can't walk in the full miracle flow of God, and you can't walk in community and relationships like you're supposed to. Say it with me. God created a family. God created a nation. God created the church. The church. The ecclesia. We'll give you three facts about the church, which is your new community. Okay? You're welcome in the family of God. You're supposed to be, you're all supposed to be part of the church. I believe. Amen. For God wants all men to be saved, Paul said. And I believe he wants you, he's calling you into the church. If you're not already a part, I believe the call of God's on you this morning to come into it. Amen. Why? Because you're sitting in this building listening to me. And this is what I'm preaching. So, so the Lord's speaking through this somehow. I'm telling you, you need to be part of the church. Well, I tried church as a child. We'll try it again. Well, I was raised Baptist, bless God. Well, I was raised Presbyterian. That's beautiful. Thank God for your roots. Thank God you had that root system. Now, just come on in the church. Just come on in. Stop messing around. Amen? Stop like having smorgasbord church. I just came out of Amish country. We went to two smorgasbords. A lot of stuff in a smorgasbord. <laughs> so we have a smorgasbord mentality. I'm going to try first church, then I'm going to try second church, then I'm going to try third church, and I'm going to try fourth church. Amen. Three facts about the church. Number one, we are a victorious church. Amen. Come on, say it with me. We are, we are. a victorious church. Jesus told Peter, he said, I say unto you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. In the original language, the word hell is Hades, and Hades really was the realm of the dead. It's just like Sheol in Hebrew. It was the realm of the dead. So I always thought, you know, gates of hell, how are they like coming, or like is Satan coming out against us or something? But as I start, studied that, I really think the primary context is there's nothing that can kill the church. Not even the power of death or the realm of the dead can kill the church. But if we look at the gates of hell as a metaphor of the seat of Satan, then it would be interpreted like this. Even the place of Satan's authority cannot kill the church. The place of his power. The place where he is strategizing. You know, Al-Qaeda means the seat of battle. Dr. Malky taught me this. It's interesting. Al-Qaeda means the seat of battle. And he said it, well, I'll leave that alone. We're on alone. <laughs> but the seat of Satan's power can never overcome the church. People have tried to kill the church for 2,000 years. They tried to stamp out the early church. They, every one of the apostles except John, we believe, was martyred for their faith. The communists tried to stop the church. Roman government tried to stop the church. The kingdoms throughout the history of man have tried to stop the church. COVID tried to stop the church. But guess what? The church is coming back stronger than we've ever been. Went through a few battles, but came back more determined 
and more on fire to do what God says than ever and more determined not to listen to fear again and let it rule us. Well, preach on, Hans. I'll, I'll, I'll amen myself. Amen? Come on, come on. It can't stamp out the church and it's not going to take out the church. If the American government goes against the church tomorrow and shuts us down, guess what? We're not going to stop. We're still going to meet. We're still going to have church. Holy Ghost is still the Holy Ghost. Jesus is still on the throne. God's going to still heal people and raise people from the dead. Gospel's still going to be preached. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. I heard recently from friends in miss missiological work that the two strongest and fastest growing movements in the world right now in Christianity is in Iran and Afghanistan. Both of those extremely hostile environments to preach the gospel in, but yet it's two of the most vibrant movements in Christianity today. Isn't that funny? And in America, and what well, we're seeing revival right now too, but God's having to shake us out of an opposite effect and that is the effect of wealth and the effect of ease and luxury and all that and we thank God that God gives prosperity but nonetheless if you let it get in your spirit man and let that laziness get in your spirit then you don't want to do anything but sit at home and watch Netflix and you totally are just like lose the fire of God so you have to work at it from a different angle in the West because we work at it from the angle, God, I want to stay on fire. I want to stay fired up and I don't want all that I see to come and pollute or dilute the work of God in my life. We're going to stay on it. We're going to keep fired up. We're going to keep preaching. Hallelujah. Right now, a friend of mine told me the other day that Mario Marullo said he's seeing a greater movement or a movement right now that is as great as the Jesus movement in the 1970s. He had a tent meeting recently and had to turn people away by the thousands. And I'm talking New York, Northern California. It's My son-in-law Axel travels with Sean Foyt some, and they're seeing amazing things happen all around the nation because Sean said he just got to a point when the governor of California said, you can have church, but you, you, you can't sing. Sean said, I'm done. And he went outside, went to a beach, started having services, and drug addicts came forward getting saved, throwing their drug paraphernalia down. They started baptizing people. Hallelujah. And God started something in America. And I'm telling you, I want Fountain of Life Church to be right at the front end of it. I don't want to be looking at this 10 years down the road saying, oh my gosh, oh no. Or like my grandson, oh wow. We should have been in that, but we missed it. That's what happened to some of the Pentecostals, even in the Jesus movement. They wouldn't accept the people because they were hippies and pot smokers. Thank God for Chuck Smith and Calvary Chapel. Chuck Smith was an AG pastor. He was pastoring in Southern California, and he had these hippies come in, and uh, they're dope-smoking hippies. And they come in, he preaches the gospel, they leave, and, a, and one of his leaders came up and said, listen, we can't have these guys in here anymore. They're going to mess up the carpet. That week, Chuck Smith removed all the carpet from the church. And God sent tens of thousands of people. My friends, Mike Shree, Pat Hayes, these guys came out of the Jesus movement. My friend Lee Grady, these guys came out of the Jesus movement. Come on, church. Hallelujah. I don't know why I'm going this way. I've just been preaching like off the charts, like on my own thing today. But why don't, wouldn't you love to see Fountain of Life just to be packed out? We have to build a big sanctuary over here to hold everybody. Then we pack it out and just be filled with tattoos and gauges and drug addicts and prostitutes and people from broken homes and people who are wealthy but still just as empty as anything. And God, God coming in and saving people and turning people. See, I didn't grow up in church. I didn't grow, I didn't know how church is supposed to go. I came in from the outside. I was one of those guys. I came in from the outside. So church Church is about fire, and church is about Holy Ghost, and church is about getting your life right, and church is about crushing the spirit of religion and letting the liberty of the spirit move in a house. Hallelujah. Man, I feel it in here this morning. This is what it's about. We are the community of God. We are the people of God. We are a victorious church. Hey, come on, shout it out. I'm on the winning side.
Come on, say it with me. We are a victorious church. It's amazing how people start piling on when you have success. It's like I met so many Dallas Cowboy fans through the years. And I thought, dude, you live so far from Dallas. But it's success. I've met University of Kentucky basketball fans all around the nation. And I thought, well, I'm glad, but I went there, man. I'm a fan when it's good, and I'm a fan when it's bad, as in this year. People love some success. They love some success. I'm an Alabama football fan. Why? Well, they win a lot. <laughs> come on, why don't you come on over to the winning side? Come on over into the church. We're a victorious church. Come on, say it with me. We are, we are a unified church. The church is about unity. And, and if you read the New Testament, it's heavy about keeping unity. But what Paul teaches us in Corinthians and in Ephesians is that there should be a diversity within the unity. Or there should be unity within diversity. It should all be under the umbrella of unity. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, strive to keep the unity of the faith. Oh yeah, by the way, God has apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers who are to equip the saints for the work of service. And then he says that we are all working together as every joint and ligament supplies. We all work together for the edifying or building up of the church. That's a church growth formula right there. And I could write it in one page. It wouldn't take 300 pages. One page. The church growth formula is everybody do what they're called to do. And when everyone starts working together in unity, doing what they're called to do, the church naturally grows. Because each ligament starts moving, each muscle starts moving, and God naturally calls growth. But why is he saying all this? The overarching thing he's trying to communicate is there still needs to be unity. Every one of us have a different mixture of gifts and talents. No matter where you're from, you have a specific history. You have an anointing on your life that's specific. You have gifts and talents that God has created you with that's different. When all those come together, it's a gift mix pretty much like no one else. You are unique just like everyone else. I love that joke. But anyhow, you are unique. You are unique. And so what we need to learn to do is draw that out of you and then appreciate what God's placed in your life. I have a note I play. I have a gift I use. But I try to bring in guys with other of the fivefold giftings. Because if you only hear me, you don't get the full counsel of God, really. So I've worked very hard to bring in people who can preach at another level or give a prophetic word or come in who are amazing evangelists. And when you get around those folks, it, that, that gift kind of projects on you and you kind of want to be like them. I have a friend named Mike Shreve, and when I get around Mike, I just want to go study the Bible somewhere. Because he's like packed with like 60 years of just intense study. I get around my friend Doug Eccles. I feel like I'm, a, I'm not winning anybody to Jesus. I need to start giving some altar calls. I need to start preaching some crusades. I get around Kent Christmas. I feel like I want to go to the hills and pray like John the Baptist. And come out and breathe fire and give a prophetic word. We need that. We need those gifts working and operating because when we have all of that, we become a complete and whole person. Can somebody shout amen? amen? So there's diversity within the unity of the church. I figured out a long time ago, I'm the best Hans Hess from Buchanan County, Virginia that there's ever been. I'm the only one there's ever been. But, but I, I'm a bad T.D. Jakes. I'm a terrible Rick Warren. I'm a terrible Craig Rochelle or Stephen Furtick. Don't even want to be. I just want to be who I am. Amen? Amen. And I'm, I'm getting comfortable in my own skin to just be who I am. Come on, raise your hand and say, just, just, Lord, just let me be who you created me to be. Unity within diversity. You know, the church should be unified on all kinds of fronts. You know, looking back to the beginning of the Pentecostal movement, even at Azusa Street, there was a movement that happened in 1906 in Los Angeles, California. It all coalesced at Azusa Street by an African-American guy named William J. Seymour. He started a, uh, he came to take over the pastorate of a hole in his church. They kind of got mad at him because he was preaching baptism in the spirit. He eventually got kicked out and he started his own thing. But he was kicked out because he believed in the baptism of the Spirit, though he had never experienced it. So he messaged back home and got his female African-American pastor to come. 
and preach that message to these people who had never received. She was a former slave from the state of Virginia. She walks in a house and they're all seated for dinner and the owner says, could you pray for me right now, ma'am, to receive the Spirit? She says, hold on, son. Let's give it a minute. They sat down at dinner and eventually at one point she lays down her utensils, steps up from the table, walks and lays hands on that man. He falls out and is baptized in the Holy Spirit speaking in other tongues. It begins, oh man, I felt it. It begins the whole Azusa Street movement with a former slave from the state of Virginia. That's how it began. And then it started getting integrated. There were people from, I mean, there's the Kardashian, the, those kind of guys coming all the way from Armenia, the, the history of that family. Some of those guys end up at Azusa Street. Crazy, I know, right? Because the Holy Spirit spoke to those families to come out because persecution was coming, so they beat the Turks out of there. Don't you just love history? I, I know y'all love every time I get up. You're just like, please bring the history, Hans. It's, I didn't have enough in high school. But then there's a white guy from North Carolina named G.B. Cashwell, Gaston Barnabas Cashwell. He, he's kind of, he's at a point where he just wants more of God and he writes his, his conference leaders and he says, I can't come to conference this year. I'm going to go to California because I've heard about a move of God going on in California. He gets on a train, goes all the way to Azusa Street. He walks in and is offended because it's a mixed congregation. He eventually gets over it and he says these black brothers laid hands on me and when they did I felt like electricity go through my body from the top of my head to the sole of my feet and he was baptized in the Holy Ghost. Then they raised an offering for him. They gave him a brand new suit and a train ticket home. He got on the train and came and stopped at Dunn, North Carolina and did the same thing in Dunn that they were doing in Azusa. He started a revival in Dunn, North Carolina and I've researched the historical records and that meeting was completely integrated as well. So the move of the Holy Spirit began as a spirit thing. One writer named Frank Bartleman said the bloodline, or sorry, the color line was washed away in the blood. He went to the meeting. There was a Los Angeles Times reporter who came to the meeting, rather, to criticize and write a derogatory column of, or a story about what was going on at Azusa Street. So he comes in, and as he's sitting there taking notes, there's a girl with crippled legs who walks down the aisle, and as she got about halfway down the aisle, they straightened, and she was completely healed. Then a lady stands up and gives a prophetic, gives a word of, in, in tongues, and, it's, and this guy's back there, and she's giving this message in tongues, and he hears it. He walks up to her, and he says, Lady, I have spent years studying the Russian language. Where did you learn to speak such perfect Russian? She said, Honey, I've never been out of the state of California. I don't speak any other languages. He heard it in perfect Russian. And he wrote a glowing article about the revival instead of a derogatory article about the revival. Can somebody shout amen? amen. Come on, someone say it with me. Unity, Unity. Within, diversity. within diversity. So look at your neighbor and say, you're okay. God can use you. Hallelujah. We are a victorious church. We are a unified church. This is the community you're born into. And then finally, we're a glorious church. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5, he used the metaphor of a, of, a, of a bride and a marriage to preach a message about the church. He says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. So I've done a lot of weddings in my life counseled a lot of premarital couples and you know I've had some actually tell me say listen pastor just all I ask is when you do the ceremony don't read that submit and obey verse <laughs> and you know what I tell those girls you know what I say back to them this day is about you and I won't say a word about it it's all about you we're going to do everything you want but I tell the guys, I say, you know what? Let me tell you two things. First of all, there's a verse before that that says, submit to one another. Submit to one another. So submission isn't just a wife to her husband. Submission is the body of Christ submitting to each other. We live in accountable relationships with each other. 
And then I think he puts the greater onus on the husband and says, now you live your life in such a way that you're willing to die for your wife. All the women shouted hallelujah. And then he says this, and he says that he may sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word that he might present her to himself a glorious church. So let's, let's, let's look at this. Let's break it down and exegete it here. First of all, he's saying Christ gave himself for the church. Why? For the purpose that he might sanctify and cleanse her. He laid down his life that you and I could be brought out and sanctify and cleanse. He laid down his life that he might present her to himself a glorious bride without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she should be holy and without blemish. So God gave his life so that he might present the church as this glorious bride. You know, I've, I've performed so many weddings and I really believe the height of a wedding. I really believe the crescendo moment is not when we say I do. It's not when they exchange rings, though I think that's the holiest moment. Because covenant, a symbol of covenant is being exchanged. And I don't think it's when they kiss at the end of the ceremony. I think the, the most heightened crescendo of the wedding ceremony is after all the prelude music and all of the procession happens and everyone is in place, all the candles are lit, everyone ties straightened, everyone's in their proper position, and then everyone rises and turns and all eyes are focused on one thing, and that's that bride making her first appearance publicly in her bridal gown. Oh, hallelujah. And it's that amazing moment. I've been privileged to stand there. The bridegroom may be sweating bullets and his groomsmen may be joking him and he may be looking at me, but we're like, this is it, dude. You made it, my man. And that's just a metaphor of what God is doing with the church. He's working throughout the ages, perfecting His church. And working in and through His church so that one day, hallelujah, we're going to be able to walk through the doors and we're going to be able to be presented to Him without spot or wrinkle. That's going to be the crescendo moment that we're all climbing toward. Can somebody shout hallelujah? I don't know about you, but I want to be part of that glorious church that we're not coming in limping and our dress dragged through the mud and... Hair messed up and one shoe on, one shoe off and smoking a cigarette as we walk down the aisle. We're not doing... I think I perform weddings like that. but no, We're not doing that. We're walking in as a spotless bride and all of that regal authority and all of that wonder, hallelujah, coming in, being prepared, hallelujah, being washed in the blood, being sanctified, being taken out of the world. We're coming to a great moment. Can somebody give Him some praise in here? Oh, hallelujah. It's a glorious church. The church is not defeated. The church is victorious. The church isn't going to end in defeat. We're going to end at the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're going to end in total and complete victory. Thank you so much for listening today, watching with us, opening your heart to the Word of God. It's my highest honor to preach the Word, our church exists to reach people like you. That's why we exist, to be able to communicate the gospel to the entire world. God has given us such an amazing outreach here to be able to do it this way through the internet and stuff. It's just, it's just absolutely amazing. So I pray that God has touched you today, that God has ministered to you, and I want to pray for you right now. If you need to accept the Lord into your heart, give your life to Jesus, or if you need healing in your body or healing in your mind, I want to pray for you right now. Could you join with me? Come on, just make this declaration. Jesus, I believe you are my Lord and my Savior. I repent of all sin, and I commit my life to you right now in Jesus' name. Come on, if you need healing, stretch out your hand. Father, for those who need a healing touch, 
I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, you, that you heal them body and mind and touch them right now. We rebuke the disease and sickness that it's afflicting their body, and I pray for a complete wholeness. Come over them in the name of Jesus, and we give you thanks for it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, give him praise right where you are. Thank God for everything he's done in your life. Tell somebody what the Lord has done for you. We love you guys, and it's a privilege to come to you.